Hello humans, hello humans. It's uh, 9.55 a.m. on the 24th of October, 2024. I wanted to take a few minutes while my bread is raising here uh, to um, talk about this temporal marker that's uh, going to manifest tomorrow. And it's really cool that we can do that. Think about that, guys. We can discuss it now as a manifesting temporal marker and it hasn't uh, it hasn't appeared yet right but there's enough in the linguistics and so in this sense of the mentition applied to it the cognition applied to the idea time is very wide indeed okay uh, these aspects of it it's not doesn't mean that shit can be undone that's been in the past but it does mean that to a certain extent there are there's the potential for the intrusion of uh, the unexpected, right, of change <coughs> within the um, manifestation of anything. So, um, okay, so uh, our temporal marker, <coughs> excuse me, October 25th, 2024, of the uh, Trump and uh, Rogan discussion, uh, is a pivotal point for the um, emergence of sci-fi world, for the visibility of the emergence of sci-fi world. It's, it's emerging all, all around us. You know, um, you've got bots, right? Digital bots that are intruding in our lives. That's a sign of sci-fi world. So sci-fi world has been developing for some period of time, arguably since the 1970s. Arguably, as a result of Ingo Swan and Michael uh, Persinger getting together. Michael Persinger is the guy with the seven hertz stuff. Uh, if, again, if I can get my shit together, I'll put a link to one of his vids underneath this one. Um, in any event, so <clears throat> Ingo Swan and Persinger get together in the 1970s through the 1990s, and they do uh, remote viewing stuff, okay? So they do RV stuff. But at its core, RV stuff goes directly to the ont ontological model and um, consciousness and how consciousness functions and how it is not as the gritologists, the Einsteinians, or, or these kind of people think, okay? That's, a, uh, that's a, in my opinion, a deliberate distortion of our reality uh, for evil ends, okay? Um, so... Uh, we have to understand some things here about remote viewing that Persinger understood, and I think Ingo understood, but I never, I've never seen, I, I've seen him in some of his books discuss aspects of it, okay? Uh, but uh, he was right in the middle of the, the creation of the RV and couldn't see it as, a, as the much larger whole that we, we see it now. So... Um, one of the things about remote viewing is that all of the minds along the way are intruding on the process, or participating in the process. Persinger recognizes this with his understanding of the uh, 7 hertz frequency of the Schumann resonance bouncing around in the uh, <coughs> Earth's atmosphere, binding all of those minds into the whole local consciousness the LC, all, both capital letters, uh, that permit remote viewing to occur. Um, so Persinger got it, okay, and I think he also had a larger vision of remote viewing and uh, what it was telling us about our, our common shared reality. I do not know if he communicated that larger vision outside of his, outside of his books. I don't know if he told how much of this Ingo Swan was aware of. And Persinger, at the time that he was involved in this, had some questions about uh, contamination of the remote viewing process. And, and I've run into those contaminations myself, okay? So, because we're all bound in this group mind, RV works. But because we're all bound in this group mind, every mind in the process of doing that RV intrudes in it, okay? And in my way of thinking, 
uh, that intrusion uh, comes from uh, the difference between denotation and connotation. If you look at the roots of the words here, um, connotation refers to with, okay, it's a con, it's a um, Latin uh, phrase meaning with, joining, okay, a conjunction, right, conjunction. Um, a denotation is the is a definite, it is a tight, 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 narrow view, right? The exact, specific um, denotation or definition of something, uh, you know, definition, denotation, etc. right? Um, okay, so in my, in my understanding, what happens is that the delta between denotation and connotation as a collective within the minds is what is intruding, okay? So each and every mind can have some, we can have some expectation that there is a separation within that mind of the denotation and connotation of language. All right, so a connotation is a with, and so that's the broader way you deal with a particular word. And that, that broader connotation brings within, uh, within it, um, it that, that's what really changes over time rapidly. And the connotation changing rapidly over time affects the denotation over time, such that maybe 40 years, so maybe there's three definitions for a given word on a, a, you know, a good online dictionary, right? And so maybe the top definition now used to be the third definition down 50, 80 years ago or longer, right? Because the relationship of the definition of the denotation of the word, which would be the written description of that, all right? Connotation you can think of as how you feel about that word, what that word evokes. So it's the evocative component of uh, our consciousness associating with a specific idea that is denoted by that phrase, by that word. Okay, so um, it, it, so so you you get the basic idea. Connotation provides flavor. It provides emotion. Um, it actually involves a, a hormonal response to the denotation. But all words have, have this inextricably joined. But when someone says to you a specific word or phrase, you're going to frequently land in the realm of the connotation for that, not its denotation. Thus, if you're dealing with another type of a mind that is much more focused on what the words actually mean, not the emotions that are brought along with it, you will be using the same words, but you will be at, at loggerheads in your discussion, right? You won't be discussing the same aspects of things. In my opinion, a lot of the Elohim worship cult and all of that is down here in connotation, all right, where the emotions are involved. And that's why they prohibit strict denotation in schools. They don't want you to, to find out what a woman is in a denotative fashion such that your mind can construct its own set of connotations. They want that part eliminated such the, the definition, they're changing the definition of the words, such that they can construct a connotation that keeps you in a particular emotional state from which they can leverage actions out of you. And that's basically how revolutions work. Um, but that's also how universe works, okay? So universe periodically, as in the time we're in now, comes along and upends everything. We're in this shift of ages. We're moving into um, sci-fi world here. Uh, and the temporal markers of this, this meeting between Rogan and, and Trump is pointing to that. There will be all kinds of connotative and denotative changes as we move from, from where we are here into sci-fi world. The split on the connotations and the denotations within ourselves will widen, become much more diverse, and then it will also become 
more wide and more diverse between individuals as we thrash around and create in local consciousness the sci-fi world that, that is emerging. So, um, back to the RV work. So, in, um, uh, in this period of time in, in the early... All right, so I begin my work without knowing about, I knew about Ingo Swan from the 70s and 80s, right? But I got my inspiration uh, in 1993 on this uh, airplane ride going into Mexico City. And, uh, and I worked for a number of years and had the first run on my process in 1997 uh, with a very partially loaded um, uh, data structure, right? I didn't have many of the words defined because I was defining, I was adding another variable to that. Not only connotation and not only denotation, but also temporal locality. How much it was telling, that word was telling us in that context about the upcoming time here. I didn't know if it existed or not. I didn't know if words could pass that information. It was an attempt to discover if that was the case. I knew we were all prescient and leaked out information, but it's kind of like moot if we're leaking out something that's going to happen 500 years from now. Who cares, right? You'll never get validation of it. And validation, by the way, um, is a big deal for the RV guys, right? So uh, Dick Allgaier and all of his people get really pissed if you give them... Uh, they don't get pissed. They get irritated. It causes them issues emotionally if they don't get some level of feedback from the um, uh, from that session that validates whether they were right or wrong. Basically, it, 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 they can't be in limbo too long, or the level of correctness would degrade as a natural consequence of that. Right? You need that positive feedback that you're doing this process correctly. Otherwise, your process will get sloppy, and and you won't do it correctly. Right? And so the more feedback, it's like, oh, yeah, look, I can feel it in my right hemisphere when I get this kind of an image. And, uh, and that's where I, my brain needs to be in order to do the RV work. So you need this validation process. Okay, so Dick Allgaier. Uh, all right, so I get, I get data in 2009 through 2015 that points to this occurrence. And it, and it gradually sharpens over time, because initially it was just Joe Rogan and some president, right? And so I made the assumption at the time I'm seeing the data back in 2009 that, I'm talking, that they're, it's talking about an existing president. And now here's, you know, so um, uh, David Wilcock, okay, so he's a woo-woo guy. Uh, batshit, crazy woo-woo guy, but that's beside the point. Uh, in that period of time, uh, he was a big proponent for Obama. Rah, rah, Obama, he's going to change the world, rah, 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 right? So he's buying, David Wilcock got suckered in by the Elohim worship cult, he still is. Um, and, uh, and he was promoting their tool, Obama, and the tool's agenda, okay? Because he saw it a particular way. So, um, but the point being that at the time I was getting this, this marker here uh, for the description of Rogan interviewing a president that would then be the marker for sci-fi world uh, because it was still, it was being shown as being pivotal way back in uh, 2009. And I just could not imagine Obama being involved in that shit. He always struck me as sleazy. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, so I started disputing what I had there. Anyway, and this shit builds up the whole time, and I'm thinking, oh my god, are they, because in 2015 or so, it was clear that they were shifting Hillary into a run for president, right, as being the Obama successor. And I thought, oh my god, Rogan and, and Hillary? That's going to be sci-fi world? And, you know, but it just, so it didn't, even that didn't really fit. So that's, in that period of time, from like 2015 onward, uh, the data was really piling up around the uh, the nature, the the absolute um, iconic nature of this upcoming event, and so yeah, <laughs> so I was really worried. <laughs> I thought, oh my god, you know. And so, but then we got into, as they say, 2017 or so, and we're dealing with Trump, right? And it's like, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. And so I wanted a referential integrity check there, 
uh, you know, am I actually seeing stuff that's, or is my data process and, and my interpretation of it actually going to have any possibility of manifesting? And so that's when we get the, um, uh, the Dick Allgaier and his um, uh, future forecasting group uh, doing their RV of this situation. And so bear in mind that's, that's many years ago, right? Uh, I, th I think the work was done in 2019. Uh, I'll have to go back and check it, and I probably won't. <laughs> Just the nature of things, sir, I've got shit to do. And in fact, I gotta get on with this because I gotta get some bread in the oven in a while. Uh, okay, so they do their work. Let's just say that it was, that the work was done in 2018, right? And it might have been 2019. We have a, uh, an interview, Dick and I, in early 2020, very late 19, because we'd had um, a social media confirmation of this event taking place in a different form than we than either of us had seen it. So from 2009 onward, my data sets had always said it was just mano a mano. It was Rogan and a president, right? And in 2020, uh, we're both thinking because of uh, what um, Dick Allgaier had gotten that that was going to be the case, that we're going to have a two-person interview. That sort of thing, and um, fantastic discussion. Uh, and then in 2020, though, the, it, it kind of like morphed a little bit because the idea was Rogan, it would like moderate some kind of a debate sort of thing, right? And that never happened. Uh, so now here we are, an additional number of years later, much more closer to um, sci-fi world emerging uh, in a much more solid basis because we're also getting data sets now about the idea of this discontinuity. And the discontinuity emerges in, well, in these, in the year from, basically the discontinuity starts in this period right now, right? Um, as uh, zero point technology stuff is starting to creep into our social order even if we haven't seen it yet. There's uh, various different approaches to it, and there's lots of language about it. And we also have um, Stephen Greer. Okay, and so Stephen Greer is Dr. Stephen Greer. He's participating in this too, as is David Wilcock and everybody, right? Because this is local consciousness recreating itself uh, 20, uh, every 20 milliseconds uh, in, in this particular fashion, allowing all this stuff to occur. And so, uh, in the 1990s, so I, I started my work in like 93. That's where I got my flash of inspiration. I think Greer was actually doing his shit in um, starting his um, UFO stuff in the early 1990, right? So, or maybe 90, 90, 90 to 92, somewhere in there. Anyway, in the early 2000s here, we get um, uh, various different efforts, one of which is Greer bringing a lot of this information to Congress and bringing it out into the open, the US UFOs and all of that. Now, the point for me has always been the technology, right? I don't really give a shit about people's idea of meeting aliens. I want to discuss consciousness and things with aliens, but I really want the, the critter and the technology. I don't, I don't, you know, the aliens are going to be interesting, but, but you know, they're not a, um, not a key driving motivator for me. Anyway, though, so um, during this period of time, we have RV as a process growing, and sometime, I think it was probably in the 2000, early 2000, maybe it was even late 1990s, Dick Allgaier starts, starts learning, right? He starts doing remote viewing. So we see that it's all intermeshed such that Dick Allgaier's future forecasting group here, by the time we get into the 2019 period, was, was in a position to provide us information. Okay, so now let's divert for a second and say, universe talks to us all the time, universe provides and guides, it's an ancient saying of the Cathari, and uh, universe wants to talk to us. The Japanese, this Japanese fellow came up with a method for training your body and your mind to be in a receptive state to 
understand when universe is talking to you, not necessarily understand what the fuck it's saying, but understand when it is it is actually attempting to communicate with you, right? When that nugget uh, in this common video game is meant for you. Uh, and that's Shin Shin Soitsu Aikido, or Shin Shin Soitsu Do, which is Japanese yoga. And if you go do those exercises, you'll be able to pay more attention to all this shit, right? And get, get more out of it. Okay, so... Um, so the local consciousness needs all of this to happen. Now, local consciousness, be, we know because it, this is visible, because there are people like Dick Allgaier and myself um, uh, and others who are looking at time in a different way now that this event is manifesting, and we know the history of the remote viewing of it in detail, because we participated, because we lived through these years and did this shit, and we're looking at things in a different way. Universe, so we know, the, us guys anyway, we know Universe wants us to know this. It would not manifest unless there was a point to it. Uh, universe is quite straightforward. It's an ontological process. There is no grit involved anywhere uh, in the decision-making process. So we know for absolute fact that we're intended to know this. And that this, and we can speculate that knowing this, and the oh, we can speculate about two levels: our knowing this and the intention behind our knowing this, right? And so, uh, so I do not uh, take on board uh, external savior myths. Okay, those are entirely a Judaic. Uh, or a Jew uh, construction, right? The people in Judea didn't have anything to do with it. The, so if you're a fan of the superheroes, I've got, you know, I'll never talk to you about any of that kind of shit because that's mind control from the Jews. Superhero equals Elohim, okay? Hero, the way we define it, in, in the way in which that uh, definition came about to us, was also altered. And hero meant a demigod, an angel, okay, which is an Elohim, right, a space alien. So it all, in my, my way of thinking, is polluted, right? So I do not buy the external savior myth at all. Thus, I reject those people that say the space aliens are here to save us, all right? I reject the um, Stephen Greer's assertion that the aliens are here to save us and they've been saving our bacon for 80 years. If, if so, if they've been doing actions that have resulted in that, it's a side effect. They weren't doing it to save us. They're, they don't give a shit about us at that level. They have their own concerns and issues relative to our behavior. So I don't, I don't buy the external savior myth kind of shit, right? In any form, okay? So I have no sins that Christ is here to save me from, right? That's an Elohim Jew construction uh, that you sinned against the Elohim. You sinned against their... their uh, uh, evil war god uh, Yahweh uh, and uh, by not dying or whatever when he wanted you to and so that's that's the idea that you sinned against these the Jews space gods against their heroes and thus you have to have a savior and all of their rituals go to the idea that they have sinned against these space gods and that they need a messiah or a way to offload the karma of this sin it's all mind control by the space gods the Elo Elohim so, I reject all of that. Now, that said, I, I am a, a fierce proponent of um, Shin Shin Soitsu Do, right? The idea that the universe talks to us continuously. It can't be other than that because of the ontological model. And I'm a very um, uh, dedicated explorer of what that can mean to us as individuals and collectively. Uh, you know, if we know the game we're playing, then we can have strategy that extends out into the future. We're not reacting in the moment. All right? Okay, so anybody telling me any kind of space alien is going to save my ass in any situation is full of shit. I don't have any, you know, I'm just not going to waste any time on them. Thus, most of the woo people I don't get involved with because they're too deluded. Um, so, okay, and this includes, so now, so just because Dick Allgaier and his future forecasting group do um, a good job and they pick this temporal marker up years ahead of time 
as, as my stuff did, as we picked it up years ahead of time. But just because the remote viewing does that does not mean that all the remote viewing that they do is that accurate or anywhere close to it. Okay, And I know for a fact that that is not the case because I participated in a couple of remote viewing things that went very bad, that didn't work. Uh, one was the fault of this guy uh, at their headquarters who jumped into the remote viewing and issued a session and I expected a few weeks of us, of he and I, thrashing out the exact question, okay? I thought he was savvy to the understanding that it is, that all minds are intruding in the process and that you'd better get your connotation and your denotations nailed down solid before you use any language whatsoever and attach it to that um, uh, generated number because it is not the generated number that the RV guys go and look at, nor is it some uh, arbitrary point in time uh, or space. It is only within the minds of all the people involved and the collective local consciousness recreating it that the RV works and the information is brought out. So it is brought out through the filters of our connotations and our denotations. And if we're off on that, uh, and we phrase the question wrong, you get bad results. So there were questions put to, for um, the Dick Allgaier's future forecasting group, which they nailed 100%, and it's absolutely meaningless. Okay, absolutely meaningless. That was the case in one of these that I commissioned. They got some information off the moon, but it wasn't anything close to what I wanted. Uh, the and uh, did not accurately define it, nor did he understand the, uh, the chain of mental processes that I wanted to see in order that we could uh, get more information than simply the, you know, is this rock on the backside of the moon blue? That kind of thing, right? Anyway, so that, I know that that shit doesn't work. One of those that, that, that they did, that they got it nailed at 100%. They were 100% accurate, but it's absolutely meaningless. And that is, and they came back with a specific day. That might be a meaningful kind of a question to ask, but they never do that. They can never bring back specific days. So, um, so um, okay, so... Uh, so not all of the future forecasting groups' uh, work is going to be meaningful, okay, even if 100% accurate. And then there's other, other RV guys out there who don't follow the same kind of protocols and are, are basically, um, you know, self-deluded, right? Uh, one of these is the academician uh, Courtney Brown with um, his Farsight group. These guys are absolute... Um, uh, total deluded uh, fellows. They, in fact, are attempting to do channeling, and they're trying to tell you that they're um, they're having an alien board meeting, and that they're sitting there, and supposedly there's invisible aliens around them, and they're communicating telepathically, and they're going to tell you shit from these aliens. This is just another Courtney Brown following falling for the external savior myth, right? And they're going to claim that there's a, these external savior entities talking through their brains. Absolute horseshit. You know, Courtney Brown's crazy. Uh, I've seen chickens that are more sound in their relationship with uh, our collective um, common shared reality than Courtney Brown. And this goes back a long fucking time. Uh, my interaction with uh, Courtney Brown. So, no, Courtney Brown and his group are full of shit. Uh, all that channeled stuff is stupid. It, channeling does not reach outside the local consciousness of your body. So you're not talking to local consciousness in the, in the broader scale of things with channeling. Uh, it does not work that way at all. Uh, I think that's in like... Detailed discussion can be found in the book uh, Thinking and Destiny. I think it's in chapter 3. But that's a big book, and there's a lot in every chapter, so I can't, uh, can't recall. Um, there's a free copy online, uh, Thinking and Destiny by Harold Percival, uh, written, I think, uh, or published in, I think, 1953, and there's a PDF you can get. Uh, anyway, so, uh, Courtney Brown stuff, we can dismiss that. We can dismiss the future forecasting groups, uh, you know, uh, seeing a civil war, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, so there's not only is there the issue of accuracy with future, or with especially with future, but with uh, remote viewing, there's also the uh, uh, issue of meaningfulness, right? 
And then for the reviewers, there's the issue of the validation. And so like this is huge validation, this Trump-Rogan thing, this is huge validation for Dick Allgaier's future forecasting group. It's not their fault as, as, as future, as um, remote viewers, if they, if they participate in a meaningless exercise because they don't know ahead of time. All they get is this weird ass number, right? And, and whatever chain of minds is behind that weird ass number is what they're tapping into. That chain of mind pulls in from the local consciousness the uh, conclusions or the images that will will filter through to the remote viewer guys from which we will develop our conclusions as to whether they, how they answered, whether that answer is uh, meaningful and, and accurate, right? Okay, so so you can see it's an extremely complex tenuous, to a certain extent amorphous, right? Not, nothing solid there at all to get hold of. Process. On the other hand, when you have it nailed down, as Ingo Swan and, and Persinger were attempting to do it, for the CIA with um, Persinger's scientific approach to all of this, when you have it n nailed down really, 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 really good, you get the Dick Allgaier future forecasting group uh, uh, remote viewing a, an incident that will end up being a pivotal temporal marker going back, oh, who knows how long, hundreds of years, okay? Uh, so, so it's really spectacular. And get this, universe wants us to see this. Universe wants us to see ourselves seeing this shit happen ahead of time. Think of why universe wants us to know this and what that, what that tells us about the potential and the ontological model. Uh, I got to go and deal with bread in a while, so I'm not going to go and divert for another 45 or, or 50 hours talking about uh, those aspects of, of the uh, really spectacular uh, bit of information that we can deduce from this uh, that universe wants us to know because we do know because we did this and it did work out this way. Even with all of the fuck ups and all the Courtney Brown bullshit and all that kind of crap in there, we still end up with this, this uh, beautiful example of seeing the future years ahead of it in an accuracy that is just staggering. See, that's something that's always really um, got me about the, uh, Dick Allgaier's level of skill and Daz, okay, and Edward. Uh, I don't know the other guys that that well. I, I don't follow these people. I don't listen to their stuff. I'm not participating in any of these groups. I occasionally, I let universe bring this stuff up and bubble it up on the internet to catch my attention in the rest of my reading and stuff, right? So that I'm not, um, I'm not actually pursuing any of these, these things. I don't want, <laughs> I'm not a member of it. I don't watch the, the um, Farsight people other than when it happens to pop up, right? And then with Courtney Brown and his Farsight guys, I can only watch maybe about six minutes of their uh, channel shit. And then I skipped through and it was all the same kind of crap. So it's like, no, you guys, there's no point in even wasting my time on it. Uh, the future forecasting group with Dick Allgaier, that's a different situation. But again, I don't follow them. A um, uh, bunch of different reasons for that, but uh, I just let Universe bring it to my attention. So Universe has a... Um, has a an aspect within it that is self-adjusting. It's adjusting all of us players in the uh, universal game as we go along. It's upgrading our mentition by allowing us to see these kind of things here such that we can think about our position within all of this and develop strategies that would aid us as individuals and aid our collective interests, right? Because we know this shit exists. <clears throat> so you can think about it this way. Um, it, it is obviously important uh, to universe that we have this information available to us at this time and have this kind of a view. You know, obviously universe is, is put me here to see this, put Dick Allgaier here to do that, this kind of thing, right? And so we can deduce that because we are at this particular junction, because we are at this particular junction, that all of this is, is also participating in that temporal marker. And that because, in my opinion, because the space aliens are involved 
universe wants us to have this particular level of skill and knowledge. It wants us to know what we are capable of. It wants us to know the capability that exists within humans, within local consciousness. And it took some great care. And let me tell you, you know, 20, 20 fucking years of really hard work on my part, as well as Dick Allgaier and so on, to get us to the point that we could do that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so basically Dick and I have paid for you guys to have this view in our flesh as we aged and all the agony and shit we went through to get to this point. So, not that we're asking for compensation. We get that from universe, not from you guys. Um, anyway, so this is the cool part of this, right? Uh, that right at this point, all of this shit here is, is converging on this uh, very, very, very pivotal, pivotal temporal marker of this interview that's coming on up tomorrow which I think I've already already listened to because I read thousands of words about it. Oh, that was something I was going to say about Dick Allgaier and his accuracy. Dick Allgaier do a, drew a drawing of Trump and Rogan. And then he, he writes down in the drawing there, he writes a bunch of the words, right? And I bet you that he is staggeringly accurate in those words that he wrote down as pertaining to that discussion, perhaps even in the order in which he wrote them. And what gets me is the, uh, you know, I'm jealous to a, to a certain extent. I had to go through tens, perhaps even millions, I'd go through at least several hundred thousands of words in order to narrow that down with the algorithmic approach to get to this list here that local consciousness provides to Dick Allgaier without even a fucking computer. <laughs> so anyway, so, so, you know, so let's check that image of the things he wrote down and after the conversation is over, right? And see how accurate he was. And then let's all sit here and contemplate what universe is telling us about this moment in time, actually tomorrow, uh, when this occurs, but also this larger moment of now seeing it ahead of time, knowing it's going to occur, being able to anticipate it occurring, and it is an event out of the blue, so to speak, right? Theoretically, nobody knew in 2023 this interview was going to take place on this day, etc. It wasn't a planned event in that sense. Uh, certainly not in the public mind. Okay, so now from, I'm going to wrap this up real quick, but so from this point forward, we are now involved in a much larger process here, and we can see ourselves in this larger process. So real history, including the history with aliens, has been under investigation since the 1970s, because Ingo Swan was involved in doing that, and Persinger had a great deal of um, interest in that subject. Okay, so that real history examination runs the entire time in the sci-fi world. They'll still be examining our history. And all the lies, they'll be writing thousands of books about all of the manipulation and all of that kind of shit, probably 500 years from now, uh, writing about this period of time and stuff. And they'll probably also, lots of people will probably also center in on this particular temporal marker and us guys being batshit crazy and being able to pull this stuff out of the woo, right? Um, which is part of the emergence, really, okay? As one paradigm, the old rigid paradigm of the Elohim worship cult from the um, Kali Yuga uh, is replaced, you actually get the effect of another paradigm emerging through it. And, and it's not, so they both simultaneously exist for some period of time, but it is where you put your energy that allows you to see that emergence or not. So, you know, Dick Allgaier and I have been involved in this emergence probably all of our lives in various different aspects of this. Okay, so we're going to have the next up here in terms of our um, uh, temporal marker and what it means to us is the, is the emergence of the, the UFOs, ZPT, and aliens. Okay, UFOs include alien reproduction vehicles. So it includes our guys and the breakaway civilization and the battles we're going to go through with those stupid motherfuckers, all different kinds of stuff going on with them. That all starts as of tomorrow. Okay. That's when in our history line, 
uh, it will start going out into the larger level of consciousness and much more is going to come up. This is where we get into uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's fears. Okay, Greer's fears, I call them. Uh, I like the fact that he's afraid of these things this particular way. I think his fears are misplaced because it won't work out the way he thinks, right? And so he doesn't have to worry about a lot of the things he is worried about at this point. Um, uh, but the fact that he was thinking about it is, you know, a good indicator of a sharp mind. Anyway, so as part of the conversation tomorrow, they will touch on the alien issue. They'll touch on UFOs, and as a result, they'll touch on zero point technology. And, and getting that out into the larger public discussion is going to fucking freak the main, mainstream, what used to be the mainstream media, uh, all the lame ass fake media, uh, because they won't really want to bring it up. And when they do bring it up, they're going to have to um, denigrate it, right? Uh, uh, say it's all, you know, it's all woo and has no real basis in reality. And so they will have to once again expose themselves because of the other stuff that's going to pile on behind this discussion here is going to just like totally blow them out of the water on those projections from their fears, right? Okay, other uh, thing here is that shortly, so some point in the future, and I'm going to say maybe it's a year from now, okay, so maybe next October, in 2025, uh, history or historians will say that, that at that point, we started seeing the invention boom. And I actually think it's already ongoing, okay? The zero point technology stuff emerging into our social order is gonna trigger uh, all kinds of other inventions because this will be a core technology. Just like the reproduction or the, um, the crash of the vehicles in Roswell brought us uh, uh, other technology brought us a core technology, which was digital circuits, and we made all this shit out of it, right? And used it to make other shit. So we can now make microfibers because of the uh, core technology of uh, digital computers and our ability to have software. And we've uh, re-engineered our social order around uh, because of that core technology. And zero point energy um, or zero point technology because it's much more than just the free energy and it's not really free but we can get into that another point uh, but that's also a core technology and we'll start putting all kinds of stuff on top of it inventing shit everywhere and so we'll be in an invention boom it's going to run for for a long time but the big peak of it here will be over these next few decades uh, the, the really satisfying uh, emergence of that core stuff getting cemented into the, the social order. So maybe that's like a 50 year invention boom. A couple of generations are going to make themselves mega wealthy as a result of this in various different ways because they're going to raise the level of, of um, wealth for humanity. And here's something to understand about that uh, before, I, before I sign off here. Okay, so we're going to pick a number. Uh, and and it, it's not meaningful in, in in the number itself. It's meaningful in the relationships that it that it describes. Okay, so um, so 365 days a year, our sun puts out uh, energy in all directions, and Earth sits out here. And 365 days a year, we absorb. 4.56 kilojoules. This is a, a number that's raised to a power, right? Like 4.56 to the uh, tenth to the twenty-fourth power. Um, so, but we're just going to concentrate on the 4.56 kilojoules, okay? So every single day, Earth absorbs that much, and we we're only absorbing about seventy percent of the energy that that hits the planet and will absorb less if Bill Gates is, and his other fuckers are up there with the chemtrails. So they're actually affecting the energy balance of the planet right now. That energy balance is needed on a daily basis in order to sustain stuff 30, 40, 50 years from now. So these chemtrail fuckers are, are um, uh, they are truly committing a crime against the planet and everybody, everything that lives on it. So I have no uh, problem personally in beating a, a chemtrail pilot to the point that his fingers are broken and he could not fly the plane. He's a, you know, I feel bad for him because he's a stupid stooge, but we have to stop this shit, okay? 
uh, for the generations 50 years from now will still be suffering the effects of this in any event. So here's the, here's the number we're dealing with. That's how much we absorb every fucking day, all right? The planet absorbs that every damn day. Humans, all of humanity, all of humanity whipping around here on Earth only converts 4.5 kilojoules per year in energy. Okay, so all of humanity, you, and we use less than the amount we convert, okay? Because all of our stuff converting the energy, we don't actually create energy and we don't destroy energy. We don't create matter and we don't destroy matter. That's impossible in this universe. Uh, we convert energy from one form to another. So we take a log, we light it on end and on one end and we get warm from it, right? So we're converting it from one form of stored energy, which is the lignans and the cellulose and so on, via fire into a dynamic energy that provides us with warmth. But in the process of doing that, sitting around that fire, 99.999% of that energy is released that we don't benefit from. We're only maybe absorbing 1% of it and getting warm, right? So our use of energy is very, very, very inefficient. Now that we're getting into sci-fi world, now that we've got this marker and we're getting into sci-fi world, we're gonna raise our ability to do both, to do conversions and raise efficiency massively. So maybe we'll be able to convert less than one, we only use, we convert this much kilojoules. We only use approximately 1%. We only gain value from approximately 1% of that amount of energy. And look at how even reducing that has caused so much suffering. The chemtrails, the, the, you know, zero emissions, all of that horse shit, you know. Uh, I would like to actually have uh, pellets of horse shit, uh, wet horse shit, so that if politicians start popping off, anybody in the audience with some bullshit like that would be, you know, we'd have a, have a law that if you hear a politician saying stuff like that, you could put a wet glob of horse shit on their face, if you were accurate, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we have to stop allowing these dumb, stupid, idiot fucking people uh, to spout this stuff and have it become um, ingrained into the body politic by the mainstream media because it is, it's actually factually damaging the planet. Uh, just on energy analysis levels. Anyway, so we only convert and, and get benefit out of 1% of converting one day's worth of energy. Right, and it takes us a whole fucking year to do that. So, uh, <laughs> so things radically, dramatically change if we can um, uh, get even. Uh, so, so the saying was that we could reduce fuel consumption globally, uh, reduce the cost of everything globally, every fucking thing uh, could be reduced. The cost of everything globally uh, could be reduced by ten to twenty percent. So you'd pay 10% to 20% less if we get 1% more efficiency out of diesel engines. Because diesel engines are behind everything. All the mining, all the um, energy production, everything. you don't have a coal plant creating electricity for you unless you got a diesel engine out there digging the fucking coal out of the ground, right? And so the more efficient the, the diesel engine, the better off you are. So imagine getting to the point where you have zero or ZPT technology, zero point technology that you can put in there in lieu of that diesel engine, then you're fucking fantastically wealthy. And you don't even need the coal plant at that point. This is the Stephen Greer fear, okay? His fear is that there's so much wealth tied up um, in our system and we're, we're, we need that system. That's This is one of the failures of his thinking. Uh, but his, his thinking is that there's so much wealth tied up in our extracting and converting that 1% of energy out of the kilojoules that fall on the planet, which create the coal and, and you know, this kind of stuff, right? Um, but he's saying that, you know, basically what he's saying is factual. All of Earth, you know, all of the wealth of Earth is tied to this 1% uh, extraction level on energy. And it's, and it's not just the wealth, it is the assets that really um, uh, has his mind bent out of shape. Because the petroleum companies uh, think they own the petroleum in the ground, right? Because they have a, a contract with a government somewhere that says they own the square footage on the top of the planet. And there's a law that says that, you know, someone can't 
drill at a slant and steal their, their oil. And all of that is an illusion. All of that shit exists only in our minds and, it's, um, and in our paper and so on. But it has to exist in the thoughts first. But if we change our paradigm on a lot of this, then I'm of the, I'm of the opinion that the universe is changing that paradigm for us. And, these, and Dr. Stephen Greer's fears, while valid, um, won't work out the way he thinks they will. We're still going to go through tons of shit and it's still going to be disruptive like you would not believe. But I don't think we're looking at a catastrophic end of everything as this stuff occurs. And I can get into the specifics as to why I think that. Um, so, I'm, so I'm arguing with him, but I'm not disputing his basic premise. Uh, I'm disputing a lot of his conclusions and the direction that those conclusions uh, take him emotionally. That's all. Okay, so I do dispute the, you know, the, the really crazy fuckers, right? You know, the the Charlie Ward and the EE systems people and, you know, the Farsight group, all of these kind of guys. Um, uh, you know, they're not really at all well connected to local consciousness. So this is where we're at. It comes up tomorrow. My bread's getting ready. I got to go start the oven and that kind of thing. Um, we'll be able to see it emerge and see what um, manifestations and, and flavor and color universe puts on this on this emergence, uh, this manifestation of this uh, temporal marker tomorrow. And that should also, at that point, seeing it happen and, and how it all comes out, should influence our thinking about what's going to be happening from that point forward. So anyway, very exciting time, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm just so thrilled. Uh, the, the understanding, the circuitous loop, the, the fact that we can in, uh, deduce stuff from what universe has provided us with all of this. It, it's just, it's mind expanding, truly is. And so, like I say, I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so I got to go get my bread. Uh, take care and, and watch this thing tomorrow. You know, it's going to be, uh, reality changes. It actually changes with that uh, appearance of that temporal marker in a very visible way. It's changing constantly every 20 milliseconds. But um, in this case, it's going to be a very persistent change. And a lot of people are going to just shit themselves. I think it's going to be so cool. All right. So take care.